Closure is sometimes seen as one of those mysteries of JavaScript. I still remember when I first grasped the idea of closure. It was an aha moment for me. And since being able to grasp that, I've been able to see how much it is used within JavaScript and also I've been able to apply it to solve certain problems. So closure is not a new construct. It's simply a concept that's used to describe what, what's possible within JavaScript. And by understanding it, it opens up possibilities for you that you may not have thought of in the past. And it enables you to understand JavaScript code that is frequently being written out there. So let's take a few moments and demystify the whole idea of closure. Now closure is closely related to scope. So I want to define scope briefly as a starting point. Now we've created a previous video on scope, so you may want to visit that to review scope in more detail. But basically, JavaScript uses function scope, meaning functions determine the scope of items that are declared within that function. And scope basically refers to the rules that determine where within a pro our program, the program we write, variables and functions are accessible. So I'm going to jump out to Sublime and take a look at a simple function, actually two functions that I've created. Both of these functions define scope. Now first off we have global scope, which they are defined in. But inside of the functions, there is scope as well. Now, function two is defined inside of func. And because it's defined inside of func, it has access to the scope of func. And here's the scope of func. However, func three being de defined outside of func does not have access to the scope of func. And that's easy to see when we simply call func and func3. Display the console first and refresh. Down below we see a 5 printed out. But then we see a reference error when we called func3. Because func3 tries to access variables that do not exist for it. The rules of scope say it cannot access the variables that have been declared inside of this function. But when we called func, it called func2 and func2, even though it defines its own scope, it also has access to its parent scope. So it is able to access those variables. Now let's define closure. I've gathered three definitions of closure that we'll look at first and then we'll look at several examples. First off, this comes from javascriptkit.com. A closure is the local variables for a function kept alive after the function has returned. So what it's saying is when a function is finished, those variables are still accessible. Another definition. Closure is when a function is able to remember and access its lexical scope, even when that function is executing outside its lexical scope. Now that definition comes from Kyle Simpson. Um, he wrote the book Scope and Closure, which is a great book for defining both of the, and understanding both of those terms. And third, a closure is a function having access to the parent scope even after the parent function has closed. That's from W3C Schools. So in these definitions, it talks about code executing outside of a scope and yet still having access to that scope. That's the commonality of those definitions of closure. 
So if we jump back to this example that I was doing, Func2 does have access to the scope, but it's executing inside that scope because it's called is very the very last thing, so it executes before this function has completely finished. So it illustrates scope, but perhaps not closure if we were to get really technical about it. So let's make a change that will show closure. And a great way to do that is with callbacks. Callbacks are definitely functions that execute outside of the scope. So I'm going to enter set timeout and I want it to execute func2 after one second. Now if you're not familiar with set timeout, this is a function that allows you to call and execute code after a certain length of time. It takes two parameters. The first is the code that will execute. Usually that is entered as a function, normally as an anonymous function. In this case, we are just calling a function. And the second parameter is the number of milliseconds that should wait before it calls that code. In this case, 1000 milliseconds, one second. So when we call this, it will set up the scope, it will set up this function, and then it will call set timeout. And at the time, right after it calls set timeout, this function is done, it closes, it's no longer running. However, a second later, it then calls a function that was part of it. And that function right here then has access to these variables because it retains that access to the scope even though it's executing outside of that scope. So let's save that. Open the console and we'll go ahead and refresh and execute it. And five appears. So we get a pause of a second and then five appears. So that first function is already closed. It's done. It's executed. But we then, through the set timeout command, call back to that function that was defined inside that scope. And it still has access to its parent scope and it can add those numbers together. So one example of closure. So the way we descri would describe this is func2 closes over the scope of func and continues to have access to it. That's where the term closure comes from. All right, another example. I'm going to go to a different page where I've got two buttons created. I'm going to use this as an example. This will also use callbacks, but we'll use this with an event handler. I'm going to paste in some new code. So here we've declared a function counter. Inside of that, we've declared a variable CNT, which we're going to use for count, simply counting. And then we have accessed the two buttons which are on the page. They have an ID of item one and item two, and so we've grabbed those so that we can add an event listener to them. We've then, then declared a print function, and that simply logs the value of this variable to the console. That's all it does. To each one of those buttons, we've added an event listener and the, the function for the code they will execute is count one for the first one and that simply increments the CNT variable and then calls the print function. And then count two for the second one, it does the exact same thing. Now when we call this function, it will execute and it will complete and it will finish. However, when we click on the button, they will still, or buttons, they will still have access to this variable and to this function, even though that function has finished. Now one way to show this working would be simply call the counter function at this point. But what's commonly done 
when you have a function set up that you only want to execute once is simply to immediately invoke that. So the way I would do that is put parentheses after the function definition. Now since we're going to immediately invoke that, I'd remove assigning it to a variable and just out of convention, meaning it's commonly done when you are immediately invoking a function, I'll put parentheses around it. And this is called an immediately invoked function expression, but the real concept that we want to convey here is closure. That even though this function immediately invokes and finishes, function count one and function count two will still have access to the scope that was created by function counter. So it will have access to that and it will have access to the print function as well. So let's take a look at that. Save that. Refresh. Click on one button and as we can see it increments and prints out a one. Click on it again increments it again prints out a two so it keeps that variable is keeping track of the value even if I click on a second button which executes an entirely different function it still retains that value and increments it by one because they both have access to the same scope so jumping back and looking at that code again so one way to describe this is that count one has closure over the scope of counter. We could say that about count two as well. Or another way to say it is count two still retains a reference to the scope of counter. And we call that closure. All right, one additional JavaScript pattern that illustrates closure very well is the module pattern. Now, I don't plan to explain modules in a lot of detail. I just want to show you a simple module pattern and explain how closure is involved. So I'll paste in some new code. Now, what we've done here, we've set up a variable, and then that variable is equal to an immediately invoked function expression and iffy. So that simply means that this is going to execute as soon as this page loads. Now one thing that we've done different is at the end of that function we return something. So that variable will now contain the contents of what we have returned. Now what is it that we're returning? Well, it's some of the things we've defined within this module. One is a sum it function and one is a multiply it function. Both of these functions we can pass in a value and it will add it to a variable that was defined or that was declared inside the scope of module. And it will also call a function that was declared inside the scope of module. So these two functions will retain a reference to both of those, which we call closure. And we can refer to them anytime we want by going app.summit or app.multiply it because we return those two functions as part of an object literal. So let's save that, refresh this, and take a look at how that works. App.summit, let's pass in a five, and it prints out an eight. Let's do app.multiply it, pass in a five again, And it looks like I left out part of this function. That's what I get for hurrying fast. So we'll add that back in. Refresh again. Whoops. 
pass in 5, and it returns a 15. So we now have access to both of those functions, and we can use them anytime we want. And we can use them throughout our code. And both of those will ha always have access to the function printed, and I'll have access to the variable a because of closure. Hopefully that helped you understand closure better. Hopefully you had a few aha moments. Those are exciting to get with JavaScript because then you begin to understand things better. If this video brought up questions or comments, please put them in the comment area. And if you found this helpful, like the video, subscribe to the channel, and best of luck in your future JavaScript endeavors.